Before America's entry into World War II, a group of courageous American pilots known as the Flying Tigers take on the overwhelming might of the Imperial Japanese Air Force. These high-flying soldiers of fortune slash through the skies of the Far East, helping stop the Japanese march across China. Their fame spreads, and tales of their daring exploits read like popular fiction. Using state-of-the-art computer animation, you're in the cockpit as the rugged American P-40 Tomahawk takes on the agile Japanese Ki-27 Nate. Experience the battle, dissect the tactics, relive the dogfights. December 20th, 1941. 10 Japanese twin-engined Ki-21 Sally bombers fly toward the southern Chinese city of Kunming. As they near their target, the Japanese bomber pilots are stunned to see four small fighter aircraft bearing down on them. The approaching P-40 Tomahawks open fire. Caught off guard, the Sallies quickly jettison their bomb load and turn full throttle toward home but 10 more of the camouflaged fighters appear. The fighters are unlike any aircraft they've ever encountered. They're fast and expertly flown. Their wings bear the national markings of the Chinese Air Force, but their nose sports the gaping maw of a great shark. It's the Flying Tigers now in their first combat over the skies of Southeast Asia. Raining deadly tracers on the twin-engined aircraft, a fighter barely misses slamming into one of the Sallies and, at the last second, slides beneath it. The bomber bursts into flame and noses over in a death spiral. Four of the Japanese aircraft are blown out of the sky. Wounded, the six remaining Sallies limp back to their base. That first combat on December 20th, 1941, represented a watershed in the history of military aviation in China. This was the first time that a thoroughly modern, professional uh, air force staffed by Americans engaged the Japanese on the Asian mainland and it was a stunning success. The Japanese didn't know who the mysterious aviators were. But the grateful Chinese did. And when a Chinese newspaper recounted the lopsided victory, they gave these brave pilots a name. The Chinese paper had come up with the expression, they're fighting like tigers, flying tigers. The pilots were Americans, volunteers serving in the Chinese Air Force. They found themselves fighting for the Chinese thanks to a remarkable aviator named Claire Lee Chennault. An officer in the Army Air Corps in the 1930s, Chennault earned a reputation as an authority on fighter tactics and as a fearless pilot and able leader. By the age of 40, he had commanded a fighter squadron and had toured the country as lead pilot of the Army's first aerobatic team. An adamant and gruff advocate for more and better fighter aircraft, Chenault had stepped on one too many toes at Army headquarters. In 1937, he was asked to resign his officer's commission and retire. The following day, he accepted an offer from the Chinese. 1937, he was asked to go to China to do an evaluation of the Chinese Air Force. The Japanese had been carrying on their, their terror bombing campaign, and the, the little Chinese Air Force was being beaten and was eventually beaten badly. In 1937, two years before the outbreak of World War II, the Japanese expanded their grip on Manchuria. The Chinese suffered terribly. Its seaports were attacked, 
and natural resources were seized to feed the imperial war machine. Towns were bombed relentlessly as the Japanese adopted a terror policy called the Three Alls. Kill all, loot all, burn all. With obsolete aircraft, the Chinese Air Force was no match for the efficient, modern, and brutal Japanese. Claire Chennault had a solution. The Chinese Air Force had been decimated, and it was important to keep China in the war. And the only way they could keep China in the war, they needed an instant air force. And the only way you're going to get an instant air force is to recruit professionals like the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. So Chanel came back to the States to make his case. In early 1941, the United States was not yet at war with Japan. If American airmen were to fight the Japanese, they would have to do it as members of the Chinese Air Force. Working with secret U.S. government approval, Chennault put out the word that the Chinese were looking to hire qualified pilots and mechanics. They were allowed to resign from the U.S. Armed Forces, turn around and sign a lucrative contract with the Chinese government. The pay was real, very good. The lowest pay for a pilot was $600 a month. That's for a wingman. Then you had uh, 650 for a flight leader, 750 for a squadron leader. So that was very attractive. At nearly three times the usual salary of a military aviator, word of the generous offer spread quickly. It didn't take long to fill a roster with 99 eager pilots. Recruiters also contracted about 200 enlisted aircraft mechanics, armorers, radio operators, administrators, and even a chaplain. By July 1941, the airmen had traveled to Kidao Airfield in Burma, an airbase borrowed from the British. It was strategically located 300 miles from Lashio, the last stop of the Burma Road, the main supply route into China. The single biggest reason for the Flying Tiger's existence was to defend the Burma Road. That road, which ran, as uh, the name implies, from Burma into southern China, was the major supply route for sustaining uh, Chinese military operations against the Japanese in that part of the world. At Kidao Airfield, they took possession of their new aircraft, the P-40, and an official name, the American Volunteer Group, or AVG. Chennault divided his unit into three pursuit squadrons. Each had its own logo, but in the fall of 1941, all the squadrons adopted the soon-to-be-famous paint scheme for their tomahawks. The menacing, grinning shark's mouth would become synonymous with the flying tigers. We're looking at a publication that comes out of India, and it showed a lot of these Aussie airplanes, the P-40, just like we had and it uh, showed the shark's mouth on it. And it lends itself so well to that airplane uh, that we adopted it. By December 1941, the pilots of the AVG had been training for months, but had yet to test their skills. A few days before Christmas, they got their chance. On December 20th, they intercept and destroy four out of ten Sally bombers before they strike Kunming, China. Three days later, they defeat another Japanese attack and rack up 11 kills with five more probables. And on December 25th, they down an astounding 24 Japanese planes, a present for Hirohito on Christmas Day. But these early actions are all defensive, stopping incoming bomber raids. A few days after the new year, the Flying Tigers take the fight to the Japanese. January 3, 1942. It's pilot David Tex Hill's first mission for the Flying Tigers. Tex Hill left the Navy to volunteer, 
he's eager for action. He and three other American pilots aim their P-40 Tomahawks toward the Japanese airfield at Rahang, Thailand. The plan? Arrive at dawn and devastate enemy aircraft on the ground. Jack Newkirk, who was the squadron leader, and he had Bert Christman on his wing, and Jim Howard leading the element, and I was on Jim's wing. Shortly after takeoff, one of the P-40s radios in. Bert Christman had engine trouble, so he had to turn back. Crispin heads for home. The three remaining P-40s continue on. They're over the target at first light. They make a left turn to align with the field and begin a shallow dive. The pilots line up one behind the other, about 950 feet apart, known as a string formation. They would bend it over, which means to put your airplane in a dive, and uh, accelerate as they came down to strafe the aircraft on the ground. Their 1,200 horsepower Allison engines scream as they dive towards the airfield at 300 miles per hour. Jim Howard strafes the area, breaking the airfield with machine gun fire. Tex Hill dives after him, preparing his own strafing run. But the run is cut short. Tex sees a KI-27 Nate at 10 o'clock streaking in right onto Howard's tail. It's Tex's first time in combat, and his friend's life is in his hands. January 3rd, 1942. The Flying Tigers take the fight to the Japanese and attack an airfield at Rahang, Thailand. Tex Hill's flight lead, Jim Howard, has just been attacked by a Japanese Nate. Jim Howard is here. The Nate is on his tail, here. Tex is here. Jim Howard strafes the airfield. And the Nate pumps lead into him. Tex closes on the Nate's tail and lines him up in his crosshairs. Our ammo was loaded with every fifth round was a tracer. So it looked like a, just a big hose, you know, going out there. So I just looking right through the windscreen and following those tracers, and it blew up right in front of me. He blasts through the churning fireball. At the other end of the airfield, Jim Howard pulls up from his strafing run intact. It's Texas' first victory, but there's no time to celebrate. Another Nate is at 12 o'clock high, directly in front of him. When I saw that other guy who's starting to make a pass on me, then I turned into him head on. It's a defining moment for Tex, when he would demonstrate perfectly the strengths of the P-40 over the Japanese Nate. The P-40 was built by the Curtis Aircraft Company in Buffalo, New York. Claire Chenault obtained 100 that were originally destined for the British RAF. The P-40B was rugged, could reach 378 miles per hour, and was heavily armed with two 50 caliber nose-mounted machine guns and four wing-mounted 30 calibers. It also had thick armor around the engine and cockpit to protect the pilot. Its opponent is the Nakajima Ki-27 Nate, which entered service in 1936. The Nate had an air-cooled radial engine and fixed landing gear. Its top speed was 305 miles per hour, and it was armed with one 12.7 millimeter and one 7.7 millimeter nose-mounted machine gun. The P-40 had better firepower and armor, but it was heavy and could not turn with the much lighter Japanese Nate. These fundamental differences in aircraft design philosophy were at the core of Claire Chenault's approach to dogfighting. 
and the type of attacks he typically set up was to come in at high altitude, make screaming diving attacks against Japanese formations, take the energy that they built up, zoom climb up to a high altitude again, and come back around. He told his pilots, do not dogfight with the Japanese airplanes, certain death. Facing a Japanese nate head on, Tex Hill applies these tactics. He knows the way to dogfight with a nate is not to dogfight at all. Instead, he'll charge him with machine guns blazing. Tex Hill is here. The nate is here. Tex will pull up into the nate, aim towards him, and attack him head on. I'm pulling into him, and uh, of course, I had the firepower on the, on the head on. The fighters close at over 600 miles per hour. The nape peppers Texas aircraft, but the P-40's armor plate does its job. Eventually, the uh, lighter armored Nate couldn't take the punishment and ended up spiraling out of control. The Nate spirals into the jungle. The fight's over. I had no idea what Howard and uh, Newkirk were. I just headed right home, get out of that area. Suddenly, Tex feels an intense vibration. His plane is shaking, unlike anything he's ever felt before. The instruments are probably just almost shaking out of the panel itself, and he's probably wondering if he's even going to make it back to base. He finally reaches Mingladon Airfield, where Howard and Newkirk have also landed safely. He looks at his plane. He shot uh, 33 holes in my airplane. Some of his bullets stuck in my prop, and it threw the prop out of uh, balance. And uh, I, I thought the engine was coming out of the airplane. The Flying Tiger's first offensive mission against the Japanese is a success. Four enemy fighters destroyed in the air, four bombers on the ground. They were also gaining notoriety. The Flying Tigers didn't use military ranks or military discipline. They fought and played by their own rules, their raucous antics fueling their fame. In Rangoon, they rode water buffalo down the street. They shot up the chandeliers in their favorite watering hole. They even had a pet leopard. Chenault looked the other way, allowing the pilots to relieve the tension of constant combat but he insisted on total discipline in the air. I think he was an excellent leader. If you did your job right, why, he would back you at every time. During its six months in combat, this handful of American soldiers of fortune claimed nearly 130 Japanese aircraft. 11 went down under the guns of Tex Hill's P-40 Tomahawk. Here's a, a ragtag mercenary organization of former Army, Navy, Air Force officers and enlisted men who took on the Japanese head to head, very close to Japanese home islands, and proved that the, uh, the enemy who appeared to be 10 feet tall could be whittled down to size. But after Pearl Harbor, a mercenary army wasn't needed anymore. The full might of the US military was now in the war. Despite their legendary combat record, the decision was made to allow the American Volunteer Group's contract with the Chinese government to expire on July 4, 1942. But the Flying Tigers would live on. The Army soon created the China Air Task Force to oversee the air war in the Far East. The mission and men of the AVG would be rolled into the new unit as the 23rd Fighter Group. The China Air Task Force came under the control of colorful theater commander Joseph Vinegar Joe Stilwell. The transition from the AVG to the China Air Task Force was somewhat messy. The pilots were being coerced to stay in the China Air Task Force and it left a lot of bitter feelings. Stilwell brought in General Clayton Bissell to talk to the AVG. He could not have chosen a poorer man for the job. The Flying Tigers were gathered in an auditorium, and uh, he basically laid it out. He said, we want you to stay. 
If you don't want to stay, then you can go home, but we will have draft boards waiting for you at the gangplank in the United States, and you'll be drafted into the Army as privates in the infantry. The pilots didn't take well to Stillwell's intimidation and threatened to leave en masse. Claire Chenault reactivated his commission and was promoted to general. He set out to clean up the mess and preserve the fighting spirit that made the Flying Tigers famous. He called Tex Hill into his office. And Chenault said, I think Bissell poisoned them. I don't think many of them are planning to stay. If I lose you, Tex, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And Tex immediately said, General, I'll stay as long as you need me. Chenault was obviously relieved and asked Tex to kind of talk to some of the guys and see if they would stay on, because these were the veterans. In the end, 26 out of the remaining 90 AVG pilots and 57 out of 190 ground crew extended their contracts for two weeks, enough time to train the new arrivals. Tex and Chenault persuaded five Flying Tiger pilots to stay on longer to fight with the new command. On July 29, 1942, the new Flying Tigers would be in action. The Japanese mount a concerted effort to wipe them out. Several nights in a row, waves of Japanese bombers pummel the airstrip at Hengyang Airfield. Frustrated by the attacks, a soft-spoken, talented fighter pilot named John Allison approaches Tex Hill. I said to Tex, as the ABG tried to stop him at night, and if I remember correctly, he said, well, we, we made some attempts, but we were never very successful at it. So I said to Tex, well, if they come tomorrow, I'm going to be up there. The bombers do return, and this time, John Allison and Tex Hill have a plan. It would be Allison's first taste of combat, and under a full moon, he would engage in one of the most famous dogfights in Flying Tiger's history. July 29, 1942, a full moon shines brightly over Hengyang Airfield. The Flying Tigers are in action again, and John Allison will get his first taste of combat. Allison has been alerted that a Japanese bomber formation is en route to attack the Tigers' base. He straps into his P-40 and launches into the air. John Allison reminds me of no one as much as Jimmy Doolittle. They're both short in stature, very focused, precise types of aviation professionals, but when each of them climbed in the airplane, strapped in and started the engine, there was a personality change. Tex Hill and John Allison have worked out a clever tactic to detect and engage the formation. Previous raids had shown them that the Japanese liked to bomb targets from 15,000 feet. We didn't want them to get underneath us because at night you just can't see them, although you could see the flame from their exhaust. Allison and veteran AVG pilot Ajax Bombler will be flying in a position called Up Moon. Lacking radar or navigation aids, the moonlight is their only help in detecting the Japanese. If the Japanese come in at their normal altitude, both pilots will see them silhouetted against the moonlit sky. If the Japanese come in under Allison, Bombler will see them. If they come in under Bombler, they will be low enough for the ground crew to spot them and radio in. Bombler levels off at 9,000 feet. Allison continues on to orbit at 12,000 feet. Somewhere in the darkness, the formation of six Japanese Ki-21 bombers approach in two three-plane elements. The Mitsubishi Ki-21 bomber, better known to the Allies as the Sally, was the workhorse of the Japanese Army Air Force in China. It could carry over 2,000 pounds of bombs, the Sally had incredible range, but this came at the cost of crew protection. It was very lightly armored. A fighter could shred the Sally with machine gun fire if he could get in close, but he would have to brave its two trainable 7.7 millimeter machine guns, one in the nose and one in the tail. Allison gets a radio call. 
crew at the airbase can hear the Sally's engines over them. Finally, they were approaching our little airport at Hang Yang from the north. Allison and Bombler scan the skies, peering through the darkness for a glimpse of the bomber's exhaust. Allison twists his head around and catches a flash of exhaust. Three Sallies above him. I was 3,000 feet below them. I immediately opened the throttle full power and started to climb, and I said, uh, OK, fellows, watch the fireworks. Allison targets one of the three aircraft, but misjudges his closing speed. My airplane was climbing fast and also going much faster than the bombers. And I turned to follow them, and I was right in the middle of the formation. Suddenly, streams of tracers bracket Allison's P-40. They were shooting at me, and my radio went dead. They had hit my radio. This is before I'd fired a shot. And they'd put one round right through the seat and into my parachute. His engine is peppered as he flies through the stream of bullets. Allison must act quickly. In order to reposition himself behind the bombers, he'll rudder hard left and throttle down. It causes his plane to skid to the side and dramatically cuts his airspeed. The tactic works perfectly. I probably wasn't 200 feet behind them, maybe even closer. And my first rounds are down the fuselage. And uh, I know I must have killed everybody in, in, in the airplane. The attack from point blank range shreds the bomber. The wounded Sally pitches hard up, hemorrhaging oil, which splatters Allison's windshield. Allison has just knocked out one Sally, but there are two left. The formation's right wingman is the closest target, but its rear gunner has Allison in his crosshairs. Allison rolls right and swings in on the bomber's six, braving a hail of tracer fire. The one that had been hitting me on the right, hitting me most, I just gave him a burst and he exploded. It's a confirmed kill. There's just one Sally left in the formation. The leader, but Allison's P-40 is wounded. It's taken a tremendous beating. I didn't realize how hard I had been hit but they'd actually knocked a five-inch hole through the crankcase. And all the oil was draining out, which I didn't know that. Thanks to the P-40 and its ruggedness, it kept flying. Allison breaks left, slams his throttle forward, drawing a bead on the lead Sally. His bullets impact the aircraft's left engine. Trailing flaming debris, the Sally disappears into the darkness. It's Allison's third bomber. But with flames licking his engine cowling, it's time to head back to base and try to make an emergency landing. When the airplane really started to burn, uh, I kind of panicked. And uh, I was going so fast, I couldn't get into the airport. But fortunately, the river was right out ahead of me. And I said, oh, well, I can make the river. Allison puts his crippled P-40 into the Siang Kiang River. I popped out of the airplane, swam over to a log raft. A Chinese young man ran out across the logs, pulled me up. And in my best Chinese, I was shouting, I'm an American. <laughs> I'm an American. Four of the six Japanese bombers sent to strike the airfield are shot down. But these six bombers are just the first wave. Only hours later, in the light of day, the Japanese would send a far larger formation to eliminate the Americans once and for all. And this time, they're bringing escort, a formation of advanced fighters more powerful than the NATO. They'll test the flying tigers like never before. 
July 30th, 1942, Southeast China. The 75th Fighter Squadron of the Flying Tigers scrambled to intercept a formation of enemy aircraft sent to level their home base at Hengyang Airfield. Tex Hill leads 10 P-40s into the fight. Hill climbs to meet a formation of 27 Japanese fighters that are leading the onslaught. And then here comes this big fighter sweep. Tex Hill is here. The formation of enemy fighters are here. Tex must climb to engage them. In true Flying Tigers style, he'll attack them head on. They aren't the familiar Nates. The fighters are a newer, advanced Japanese aircraft. The Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar is the successor to the Nate and entered service in the Pacific in 1941. Like all Japanese fighters, it traded armor for performance. Powered by a 1,150 horsepower engine and armed with two 12.7 millimeter machine guns, it could fly faster and higher than the Nate. And they were flown by skilled Japanese army pilots. All through the 1930s, the Japanese developed their military air arm. Both naval and army aviators were highly skilled warriors of the emperor. The Japanese military culture was extremely mission-oriented. It was said that every Japanese warrior owed the emperor his life. And if the mission called for sacrificing his life in advancing the, uh, the cause of the emperor, who many Japanese literally considered a living god, that was not only required, it was also deemed a significant honor. Those guys were very well trained. I said, you know, the Japanese, anything that they did or set out to do, uh, they just really excelled in it. The Oscars spot the P-40s and move to engage. Tex opens his throttle, leading his squad of P-40s into the teeth of the Japanese assault. Tex will use the same tactics that have made the Flying Tigers famous. One of the Japanese Oscars pulls ahead of the rest. He goes head to head with Tex. This guy and I came head on doing about 250 or something like that. He's doing around 200, that's pretty fast. But you know, you get a fixation on something like that. Sometimes uh, with closing rate like that, well, you could very easily collide. Tex and the Oscar open fire at the same time. The P-40 shudders as the Oscar's bullets hit home. Tex ignores it. He keeps closing. His six machine guns have a heavier weight of fire than the Oscar's two 12.7 millimeter guns. The minute I hit him, he started smoking. He immediately began to trail a thin trail of smoke, and we knew he was hit, and probably fatally. The Oscar is an advanced Japanese fighter, but its weakness is the same, no armor. A split second before they collide, the Oscar bursts into flame and falls away. Tex Hill's P-40s went on to down 15 enemy fighters in the raid. The Japanese attack fails, and the Flying Tiger's home airfield is spared. The Japanese effort is derailed by Chenault's well-honed tactics. Avoid the turning fight and use the P-40's superior speed, power, and heavy armament. The tactics that worked against the Nate were equally effective against the Oscar. The China Air Task Force goes on the offensive. Japanese military and industrial sites are targeted throughout Southeast Asia. August 12, 1942, 
B-24 heavy bombers, supported by flying Tiger P-40s, attacked the key shipping center at Haiphong, destroying ships, airfields, and vital supply dumps. In October, P-40s dive-bombed Japanese supply lines and strafe convoys in Burma. On November 27th, the largest force in China Air Task Force history strikes the port city of Canton on the Pearl River Delta. But on March 19, 1943, the small, scrappy China Air Task Force was replaced by a new organization, the 14th Air Force. Claire Chenault took command. So naturally, the newcomers, the new guys on the block, attached themselves to the Flying Tiger name. After all, the same Claire Chenault was their commanding officer as well. John Allison leads some of the most successful raids of the entire war, but his Asian tour is coming to a close. He is to be reassigned to the European theater. But on his last day in China, Allison will find himself in the most harrowing dogfight of his career. May 31st, 1943. John Allison's last mission as a flying tiger in China. He's flying with a squadron of Chinese pilots. One Chinese squadron had just gotten brand new P-40s, and General Shaw asked me if I would go up and fly with them, and I said I'd be delighted to do that. Since before the Tiger's arrival in China, Americans had been training and advising nationalist Chinese pilots. I had seven Chinese pilots, and I should have had two American wingmen, but one of them couldn't get his airplane started. Allison and his Chinese wingman escort B-24s in a mission to attack a Japanese base at Ichan. The bombers, proud to be a part of the Flying Tiger's legacy, have painted each B-24 nose with the famous shark's teeth. There's heavy cloud cover as the P-40 fighters and B-24 bombers reach the target at Ichan. Allison spots a break in the clouds. He'll go down to reconnoiter. He radios the rest of the formation to stay above the clouds. I said, let me go by myself. So I started and I turned around and I look back and I've got myself and my wingman and then behind us, are these nine B-24. And while we were having this conversation, all of a sudden it's just as if someone had taken a handful of pepper and thrown it up through these black spots for busting through the ceiling. 20 Japanese Oscars have suddenly appeared. They're heading directly for the B-24s. Allison is here. The enemy Oscars climb towards the B-24s here. Allison must find some way to engage and divert the fighters from the bomber formation. He must act quickly. The lighter and more agile Japanese fighters are closing fast on the B-24s. Allison jams the stick back and rudders right in a climbing turn. And I found myself climbing with all these Japanese fighters. He pulls up on an easy target, an Oscar right in front of him. The tracers hit his cockpit, and he just rolled over and dove straight into the cloud. One Oscar is down, but 19 are still pressing the attack. He maneuvers through the enemy formation then lines up another Oscar in his sights. I hit him and he did catch fire. So I knew I got that one. Allison pulls into a high G climb. Three Oscars are attacking a B-24. Before he reaches the vulnerable bomber, he spots another bandit at 3 o'clock. Allison has to make a split-second decision. Allison is here. 
The bombers are here. The Oscar is on his three o'clock here. But I figured that I could just pull my airplane up almost into a stall, and that I might be able to divert these three from their attack on the bombers. It's a gutsy move. Allison will climb vertically towards the Oscars, letting loose a stream of fire to disrupt their attack. But he'll lose airspeed in the climb. If he stalls, he'll be an easy target for the Oscar on his tail. Allison pulls the stick into his chest. His airspeed falls off. He presses the trigger. His P-40 shudders in a stall. The Oscar opens fire. And the next thing I knew, I lost my rudder. This airplane coming up from below had hit the main hinge of our rudder, and it fell off. But instead of leaving the airplane, it was still connected by the cable, and it started a terrible vibration. With his rudder gone, uh, Allison can't really maneuver his aircraft. The only thing he can do is just keep it level and airborne. So he's now vulnerable to any other enemy aircraft out there that uh, decides to take him out. The P-40 vibrates uncontrollably as it levels off. The Oscar rolls into position, lining up an easy kill. From 200 feet away, the Japanese plane fires. Pieces fly off Allison's fighter. The rugged P-40 absorbs the hits, but it can't stay in the air much longer. And I said, well, if somebody doesn't help me soon, this is it. I'm gone. All of a sudden, I'm absolutely enveloped in a hail of tracers. A Chinese fighter pilot has come to Allison's rescue. He's behind the Oscar, firing wildly. I'd seen him <laughs> from one perspective. Now I was seeing him from a, a, another and a fatal one. And I thought, he, he's going to kill us both. But the Chinese P-40 kills the Oscar. It goes down flaming. Barely hanging in the air, Allison turns for home, nursing his shredded Warhawk back to base. The B-24s successfully bomb the Japanese runways at Ichan. Five enemy fighters are shot down. One Chinese P-40 is lost. John Allison left the Flying Tigers in May 1943, but returned to Asia only a few months later to help form the first Air Commandos with Philip Cochrane. The first Air Commandos supported the Allied effort in Burma and pioneered the use of gliders for long-range airdrops deep behind enemy lines. Tex Hill stayed in China until November 1944. He became a triple ace, downing 15 enemy aircraft. Claire Chenault led the 14th Air Force until 1945 when he retired. He stayed in the Far East after World War II, assisting Chiang Kai-shek in his war against Chinese communists in the late 1940s. The Flying Tigers of the 23rd Fighter Group went on to become one of the highest scoring fighter groups of World War II. From 1942 until 1945, they destroyed over 1,000 Japanese aircraft. They sank 184 enemy merchant ships, destroyed 817 bridges, 1,225 locomotives, and killed nearly 60,000 Japanese troops. Their aggressiveness and skill carried forward the legacy of the original Flying Tigers, whose exploits became the stuff of legend. The shark-mouthed P-40s challenged the forces of tyranny with incredible ferocity. raising the spirits of millions of Americans and Chinese in the darkest days of World War II.